nutrient prescription. So let's start with nutrient prescription. This is a challenging aspect when one tries to assess the energy and protein needs of a critically ill child and determine the goal that needs to be prescribed right at the outset of the admission process. Under conditions of stress, which could be in the form of surgery, burns, sepsis, or trauma, the human body responds in a predictable and almost uh, stereotypic fashion. It mobilizes intrinsic substrate in an effort to synthesize additional energy, to engage in the anti-inflammatory response, and to promote healing. Uh, in general, there is a net increase in muscle protein breakdown. This results in a large amount of amino acids to be released into the body pool. These free amino acids are used as building blocks for rapid synthesis of proteins. These proteins are then directed towards the anti-inflammatory response and also for tissue repair. The remaining amino acids are then used as, um, as the gluconeogenetic precursor. The carbon skeletons are used to form glucose. Now, Unless there is enough energy and protein provided during this critical phase of metabolic stress response, one would easily imagine a large amount of muscle protein that is going to be lost at such a critical stage. The stress response is also characterized by increased rates of fatty acid oxidation and lipid breakdown. This puts the metabolically stressed child uh, or a previously malnourished child at a very high risk of developing essential fatty acid deficiency. So it appears that this metabolic stress response puts the child at risk of both muscle protein breakdown and fat breakdown. And it was for a long time believed that the amount of energy required to fuel this response was pretty high. The characteristic uh, diagram that Long and colleagues have suggested in 1977, on the x-axis is the uh, typical stay in the ICU for a critically ill patient over a period of days, and on the y-axis, they have depicted the percentage increase in metabolic uh, response in the form of resting energy. This resting energy expenditure uh, in increases almost to the degree of 160% in some types of illnesses, and then over a period of days, gradually comes back towards normal. We shall come back to this concept in a little while. But the summary of this slide suggests that the main goal of nutrition therapy during this critical phase should be to provide adequate energy, not too much and not too little, and adequate protein. If the stress response is prolonged, then the degradation of muscle mass may actually begin to affect critical organs such as diaphragm and cardiac muscle. One can see that in children who are younger, there appears to be already a lower amount of muscle mass in relation to total body weight. In addition to this, if there is pre-existing malnutrition, these children can ill afford further muscle mass loss during the critical illness. These are uh, results of a recent analysis of literature that we conducted. We tried to examine the optimal amount of energy and protein that a critically ill child requires to maintain a positive protein balance. On the x-axis here are described the amounts of energies that were delivered to the patient on the left figure and on the right figure the amount of protein that was delivered. And one can see a direct correlation between increasing amount of energy and increasing amount of proteins with the energy balance which has been depicted on the y-axis. The conclusion of this analysis was that in at minimum 57 calories per kilogram per day and protein intake of minimum 1.5 grams per kilogram per day was required in these experimental settings to reach a positive nitrogen balance or to preserve lean body mass. Thus, it appears that in critically ill infants and children, any intake below these amounts would result in cumulative underfeeding. Now, underfeeding is not the only issue in the pediatric ICU population. Once again, a simplified cartoon in this slide uh, describes the dynamic nature of the prolonged stress response. The energy demands are depicted in the form of a broken red line and as you can see, the energy demands decrease over a period of time as the stress response continues. Similarly, the intake, the nutrient intake has been depicted by a continuous blue line. And as you can 
imagine in any patient population, the intake is diminished in the beginning and over a period of time manages to reach a level that was dis uh, prescribed. Now, the energy demand driven by the cytokines that drive the hypermetabolic response, initially being high, eventually does come down. The point at which the demands come down, unfortunately, is not known. So that is either unpredictable or variable depending on the type of illness. But one thing is for sure that on the left side of this slide, the relationship between the intake and energy demand puts the child at risk of underfeeding as we've seen before. But I want to divert your attention to the right side of the slide where there reaches a phase when energy intake has gradually succeeded and reached a level which is way beyond the energy demands which by now have gradually decreased. And this is the critical period where children may be exposed to the risk of overfeeding. It is also true that our initial assumptions of energy needs during critical illness might actually be even highly exaggerated. Once again, I show you the Long and colleagues depicted 1977 uh, energy expenditure in relation to days in the ICU figure. What is superimposed on this slide is the red line, which probably is a more accurate depiction of the modern era, wherein consistently studies have found two things. One, the energy expenditure in response to critical illness is not as high as people in the past perceived it to be. And it appears that the energy response gradually drops to normal or even below normal levels very rapidly after illness, trauma, or surgery. In fact, in some patients after cardiac surgery, the increased energy demands drop down to normal levels within six to eight hours after their surgery. Now, further in, on the same side of the slide, um, I note some of the findings of our recent studies at Children's Hospital Boston, which suggest, as have, has been suggested by previous uh, investigators, that the equations commonly used in the ICUs to predict or estimate energy uh, expenditure are frequently inaccurate and, in fact, overestimate the actual energy demands. And finally, we as physicians are ill-equipped and hence frequently uh, are inaccurate in our prediction or estimation of the patient's metabolic state at the bedside. The combination of these factors set us up for overestimating energy needs and as a result set us up for overfeeding our patients in the pediatric ICU. In such a setting, it appears that indirect calorimetry, which is shown on the left side of the slide using a metabolic cart, remains the only true method of accurate assessment of energy needs in the pediatric ICU. Details of the indirect calorimetry uh, will be presented in another uh, session um, where we will describe both the uh, device, the technique, and some of the limitations of this strategy. So in summary, it appears that when one begins to look at assessing energy needs, there is in the modern pediatric ICU a danger of both underfeeding on one hand, which results in an energy debt being accumulated, and overfeeding on the other hand, which results in a cumulative excess of energy. And both these have significant uh, morbidity or side effects, which one can ill afford uh, in a critically ill child. Optimal route for nutrient delivery. Let us now look at uh, the optimal route for nutrient delivery. Once we determine the optimal energy and protein intake amounts, uh, the selection of the best route for a particular patient to deliver these nutrients is important. Current consensus in both the adult and pediatric critical care world is to utilize the gastrointestinal tract if it is working. Enteral nutrition hence is preferred as it preserves both gut mucosal integrity and also has beneficial immune effects. Uh, it certainly decreases the risks of infection as well as costs that are related to parenteral nutrition. Now, Let's look at a simple study, very elegantly done and presented in Journal of Critical Care in 1999. In this study, 15 critically ill patients were fasted for less than a week, on an average four days, and the investigators then examined gut permeability by using a differential sugar absorption test and integrity of intestinal mucosal structure using endoscopic biopsies of the duodenum. Following the short period of fasting, patients were shown to have dramatic alterations in permeability 
and as well as uh, mucosal integrity in the form of decreased villus height and mucosal atrophy. Thus it appears that not only is enteral nutrition beneficial, but unnecessary fasting of critically ill children might also be detrimental in the pediatric ICU. Here's one uh, suggested route that we have used at Children's Hospital Boston. Here we prefer the enteral route in all our patients. Parental nutrition is only used when enteral nutrition either is anticipated to fail or uh, it is contraindicated. And the algorithm here describes our thresholds for triggering parental nutrition, which are pretty generous. We have an aggressive enteral nutrition approach wherein we use parental nutrition only if enteral nutrition is anticipated to fail by the end of seven days in an otherwise well-nourished child. In newborns and in malnourished children, we would start parental nutrition earlier, like five or three days respectively. Once the mode of feeding has been determined, the actual initiation and advancement of enteral nutrition has to follow a protocolized fashion, wherein it is advanced regularly to be able to reach the prescribed goals within a short period. The choice of feeding is always discussed and often debated. The choice of feeding could be in the stomach, which we call gastric feeding, or in the small intestine, which we call post-pyloric feeding. The exact merits of one versus the other are unclear, and while there have been studies that suggest improved nutrient delivery, faster reaching of goals via the post-pyloric route, it has not yet been convincingly shown to improve outcomes in the pediatric ICU. Also, post-pyloric tubes require experts to place them and are challenging to maintain, and hence must be used in areas where there are resources available to troubleshoot these tubes. At Children's Hospital Boston, we prefer to feed our patients in the stomach, and we use the continuous method for gastric feeding. However, in patients who have failed gastric feeding, or those who are perceived to be at risk of aspiration of their gastric contents, we do use the post-pyloric route continuously, and in a fair number of patients, approximately 18 to 20 percent. The slide here depicts some of our rationale for selecting patients at risk for aspiration and hence uh, likely to be beneficial uh, uh, to feed them by post pyloric route. Initiating, advancing, and maintaining nutrition delivery. We start feeds early, usually within 24 hours of admission where it is feasible, and we advance them gradually using a uniform guideline. I have shown you one example of our guideline which describes the rate of advancement and also provides some strategy for monitoring these patients as the feeds are being advanced for evidence of intolerance to their feeds. It provides suggestions for managing hurdles at the bedside and in patients who are not ready to advance in this fashion as shown on the right side of this slide, we, sh we frequently use trophic feeding. Point of clarification. Trophic feeding is a form of enteral nutrition that involves the delivery of small amounts of nutrients to a patient who cannot yet tolerate large volumes. Now once the nutrient delivery goals have been achieved, maintaining this optimal nutrition throughout the period of PQ uh, stay is often challenging. This is because of complexities of critical care wherein patients frequently are fasted for procedures and often are declared to be intolerant to their feeding after having previously tolerated their feeding. This is challenging for many reasons. Now, Rogers and her colleagues uh, from Australia uh, depicted that uh, very elegantly in their study, uh, which looked at a variety of barriers in a mixed pediatric ICU, which consisted of surgical, medical, and cardiac patients. They reported that only half the patients in their ICU received the estimated and prescribed energy during the, their entire ICU stay. And this figure was actually even lower for those patients who were admitted with cardiac problems. Some of the common reasons cited for the failure to deliver these nutrients uh, included fluid restriction, interruptions of enteral nutrition for procedures, and for perceived intolerance to feeding. The authors uh, describe the uh, repercussions or consequences of this kind of failure 
of enteral nutrient delivery. On the x-axis along the continuum of the patient's illness course, they showed a drop, a significant drop in, uh, nutrient, uh, in nutritional variables, in this case, weight for age z-scores, from the time of admission to the pediatric ICU to discharge. Thus, they demonstrated not just the barriers to feeding kids in their ICU, but also the consequences to their nutritional status. Here at Children's Hospital Boston, we have made similar observations in our pediatric ICU. Enteral nutrition was interrupted for up to 1,500 hours in one month, and it affected almost a third of our patients in the pediatric ICU. Many of the reasons for interrupting feeds were similar to the ones shown by Rogers and her colleagues, but what was most disconcerting was that a majority of these uh, reasons were completely avoidable. Once again, intolerance and procedures are at the top of the list uh, of reasons why people fail to deliver the prescribed energy in the pediatric ICU. Furthermore, we found that children under the age of one year and those on mechanical ventilator support were most vulnerable to enteral nutrition failure. As you can see from this slide on the left-hand table, the PRISM score or the severity of illness was not different between these patients, which means that irrespective of their severity of illness, it is the younger infants, and as you might recall from our previous uh, slides, the ones who are most vulnerable and can ill afford uh, to lose more muscle protein mass are the ones that are more likely to have failure of enteral nutrient delivery. Now, children with enteral nutrient uh, interruptions, as you can see on the right side of the uh, slide, are actually staying on the unit longer. They were less likely to reach their nutrition goals. And what was most striking is that they had almost a four times higher reliance on parental nutrition. This means that for avoidable reasons, uh, these children were deprived of enteral nutrition and as a result relied on parental nutrition with higher costs and potential for more infectious risks. Summary. Thus, optimal nutrient therapy requires not just a conscious effort to deliver the right amount of nutrients by the best route to be determined early on during the admission and initiated early and advanced safely but to regularly maintain this goal during the pediatric ICU stay. This has to be followed by a multidisciplinary effort to maintain this nutrient delivery, and one has to be aware of avoidable barriers such as the ones we and our Australian colleagues have shown uh, that exist in individual pediatric ICUs. I urge you to look into your own pediatric ICUs for barriers that might be unique to your patient population or to your personnel as these could easily derail your optimal nutrition therapy strategies in the unit. In the last uh, 10 to 15 minutes, what we have tried to do is derive some of the concepts of effective nutritional therapy in the pediatric ICU. We recap some of those here. We said that the optimal energy prescription has to rely on an accurate assessment of energy needs. We talked about the inaccuracy of our, uh, our estimation based at the bedside exam, also the inaccuracies of equations that we commonly use. We talked about the role of indirect calorimetry being the only true accurate guide for such an assessment. When we prescribe energy and deliver it, one needs to be aware of the dynamic changes that happen uh, along the course of illness and be aware of the risk of underfeeding, but more importantly, of systematic overfeeding in our pediatric ICU and be attentive to the protein intake, which needs to be at least 1.5 grams per kilogram per day in order to maintain a positive protein balance. We then talked about the route of nutrient delivery. There is no doubt that enteral nutrition is preserved uh, uh, in a large number of our patients and is preferred as a route of uh, nutrient delivery over parenteral nutrition. We talked about the route uh, of gastric versus post-pyloric. And whilst there is uh, some indication that post-pyloric uh, delivery might help speed uh, the reaching of caloric goals, uh, one needs to be aware that it requires personnel and expertise to uh, um, get uh, to be effective. 
We then talked about a protocolized fashion in which fields need to be initiated and then gradually advanced, being particularly careful of our definitions of intolerance and then providing some strategies to the bedside nurses to address hurdles as they come up. We then talked about the avoidable barriers, many of which um, are existing in most pediatric ICUs across the world, and to be aware of these barriers and incorporate them into your guideline such that they may be minimized. We've talked about the role of enteral nutrition in terms of its benefits, but also the side effect of unnecessary fasting that happens so often in our children in the ICU. And finally, I would urge you to pay close attention to energy balance. Both uh, underfeeding and overfeeding have their side effects. And protein balance, the negative nitrogen or protein balance, are certainly to the detriment of the critically ill children. And finally, in future studies, uh, one must hope that we examine the impact of all these strategies to optimize nutrition uh, to be able to uh, effect better improved outcomes in our patients. That concludes our video on effective nutritional therapy. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback. What did or didn't you like about this video? Was the content too simple, just right, or too difficult? Was the length too short, just right, or too long? Any additional comments? You can either click the Start a New Discussion button and type in feedback or send us an email at openpediatrics at childrens.harvard.edu. Note, feedback is not required to complete this activity in the Guided Learning Pathway.